Chapter 31 Zombie in the Sewage You are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Winnie Ethipul, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion after a few more steps the old man finally broke the siege of darkness. However, his eyes were no longer accustomed to the weak light from the moss. It was just a blink. When he opened his eyes again, some kind of pungent, dark green liquid hit his face directly. Ow! The shrill cry from the old man scared the rest of them. Jackson looked back subconsciously, even though he could not see anything. With both hands covering his eyes, the old man was rolling on the ground in horrible pain. The skin of his face burned and turned black instantly. His scream was so bitter that Jackson and the rest of them shuddered with fear. Several seconds later, the old man fell into the river and the scream disappeared. Jackson knew there was no way to escape. They would either kill the shadow, or be killed by it. Their only hope was to fight it. Run. Run close to that fucking thing. Jackson yelled and dashed to the shadow. Then he saw it was Lucian. Jackson was furious. Hatred replaced his fear and the only thing in his mind was to tear the fucking bastard up into thousands of pieces. When he was about to throw his dagger towards Lucian, he saw a blue beam of light in Lucian's hand. Jackson hurriedly dodged to the left and barely avoided it. Unfortunately for them, the other thug following behind him was not that lucky. The light beam hit directly in his face and a thin layer of ice quickly filmed his eyes, nose and mouth. Freezing cold invaded the guy's brain and made him lose most of his power before he could smash the ice. Dot the guy was choked. Then he banged his head fiercely on the ground. At this time Jackson finally realized that the person standing in front of him was no more that weak poor guy. However, he became a wizard, an evil wizard with terrible power. Jackson was not an idiot. He understood that by no means Lucian would let him go. Grabbing his dagger, he leaped at Lucian's throat with all his strength. Suddenly, Jackson felt a heavy pressure fell on him and then his legs caved. Then his body fell down directly onto the ground. Fuck. Jackson swore desperately. He did not know what was going on there, but he knew that losing his footing at this point would be fatal. Longer before Lucian cast Acid Splash, he had already activated his defensive magic, Disarming Loop, without saying a word. Lucian walked towards Jackson, looking at him wielding his dagger in vain. Without saying anything, Lucian grabbed Jackson's hand and slowly pushed the dagger into his neck. The gravity affected the blood and it didn't squirt out from his neck too much. It was ideal because Lucian did not want any of Jackson's dirty blood on his clothes. Jackson's great anger and pain were choked in his throat. His eyes were wide open and his eyeballs almost burst out, while his arms and legs were twitching against the wall. Jackson's nails were scratching on the ground, but soon his resistance was no more. The other guy did not take Lucian much time as well. Standing beside the underground sewage river, Lucian saw the old man's body floating quietly downstream with his face soaking in the water. Lucian felt relieved, because he thought the old man would be the biggest threat among them. Who knew if the old man had some kind of evil power from his heretic belief? All this happened within just 20 seconds. The darkness was still covering the area some distance away. The two injured beggars were still writhing in agony on the ground. Some beggars and gangsters were still floating on the water. But they were too scared to find the broken steel net to escape. Lucian did not want to kill them all by himself, and he was also not able to. His power had a limit. So the easiest way was driving the rest of them into the Balem River and leaving them to the ghosts there. But there was one problem. Lucian also could not see anything in the dark area, so he had to stand there for now, waiting for the magic to expire. At the same time, he was adjusting his respiratory rhythm in order to recover his power. Casting the four spells was very tiring. Lucian's remaining power was only enough to use either darkness or freezing rays once. Suddenly the light returned within the spell area. 
The light startled Scar and he couldn't help but close his eyes. The fear of death scared him to his knees. He trembled and prayed, May God forgive me. May God forgive me. Slowly opening his eyes, Scar was shocked to find how young the wizard was. In the dim light, the wizard had fine features. Scar had lost his mind and surrendered. He could not tell whether the man standing in front of him was an evil wizard or a hateful ghost. It was a good chance to cast eyes of stars on Scar when he was suffering a mental breakdown. The apprentice magic could mesmerize the enemy or make the person fall into a trance state. The two effects were different. The former, mesmerization, required the caster to look into the other person's eyes for almost ten minutes, while the latter, trancing, only needed some eye contact, which was more helpful in a fight. If Lucian could take control of Scar, he could use him to kill the rest of them. When Lucian was about to cast the spell, a sudden short scream pierced the silence and echoed in the whole space. Even Lucian felt very strange. As suddenly as the scream of agony started, it stopped. Lucian stopped his spelling and took a step behind his disarming loop. His freezing rays were ready to go. At this time, both Lucian and Scar saw the horrific scene. In the river, a strong and pale hand was holding tight at a gangster's neck, whose skull was half opened. A black tongue was licking the white brain inside with some effort. The owner of the tongue was a humanoid monster, whose body was so swollen that its skin appeared almost transparent. Parts of its skin were hanging, showing its rotten flesh beneath. Under the cover of the monster's seaweed dot like long hair, there were facial muscles that could fall off at any time. The place where the eyeballs should be was completely hollow, and there were two tiny white flames burning inside the two eye sockets. Another beggar's body, whose brain was completely gone already, was floating towards the river through the big hole on the steel net. The great master of Argent, the forever lasting silence, may you bless your servants. A beggar sitting next to the wall started praying desperately. The monster had a frightening power that reeked of doom. Even Lucian was extremely nervous and terrified, although he was quite a distance away from the monster. Aquatic Zombies These were the monsters in the Bolem River. They were zombies. Lucian suddenly recalled the witch's note, which described the features of the undead creature. Aquatic Zombie Immune to mind magic, no morale, immune to poison, sleep, paralysis, stun, disease effects, no fatigue, exhaustion, breath, do not feel cold, strong resistance towards ice and acid, extremely afraid of fire and light magic. But what frightened Lucian was that the note did not mention anything about the flames in the zombie's eyes. Something was definitely not right. Chapter 32 Aquatic Zombie You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Winnie Ethipu, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion According to the witch's notes, an aquatic zombie was no stronger than a male adult. But unlike most of the undead, these zombies were way faster and swift, while they still carried the features belonging to the undead, strong resistance to physical damage and other immunities. Therefore, common people and even some night squires usually did not have any chance to survive when facing these zombies, unless they had a significant advantage in numbers. Since aquatic zombies were extremely afraid of fire and light magic, a torch could burn them down if it was used properly. However, this zombie just showed up from the water, which meant its strength and agility would be increased significantly. Fire magic was also not that powerful anymore because of the water. Only light magic could be helpful under this circumstance. Lucian was absolutely not prepared. Although he knew that he had to confront aquatic zombies someday, it definitely should not be today. The witch mentioned in the note that there was a kind of material called flame jelly which could be used for alchemy. A piece of jelly could even burn in water for a while. However, at the moment Lucian mastered no useful light magic and also had no such jelly. Even worse was that somehow he felt the zombie he was facing was way stronger than the common ones described by the witch. Regarding light magic, sorcerers could never compete with pastors. 
Aside from light rays in the first circle and on, all light that related spells of apprentice level were not for attack purpose. Nevertheless, among element magic fire magic ranked top mainly because it was hard to be brought under control. The only fire magic in apprentice magic list was Marius's small fire, which could only be used to kindle firewood when an apprentice forgot his or her flints in the wild. Escape was the first idea in Lucian's mind. At the same time, the mutant zombie had finished the gangster's brain and swiftly jumped on one of the beggars. Then Lucian heard a crisp crack in the beggar's neck. Pressing its fingernails deeply into the skull, the zombie opened the beggar's head very easily like opening a walnut. Its speed and strength made Lucian stop. After seeing that, he understood that escape simply meant death. There was no other way to survive other than fight back, and for that he needed to calm down. Lucian's brain quickly started analyzing. The zombie's afraid of light. But it's very early in the morning and it is still dark outside. The zombie won't give me enough time to light anything with my flints. Marius's small fire. No, I don't know how to cast the spell yet. Lucian was standing there, watching the zombie finishing the brain and then jumping onto Scar. His mind was being occupied by different thoughts and plans, but each of them was denied by him calmly. The ability to stay calm was the most important character of an outstanding sorcerer. Mutant zombies could impose a magical effect called Dread Aura on their targets to freeze them with fear. But Scar's fear of the zombie was so great that he managed to move his legs and started running for his life. However, only after few steps, the zombie swiftly overtook him and grabbed his feet. Scar squeaked out shrill cries desperately. Disarming loop, eyes of stars, mage hand, extinguishment, acid splash, freezing ray that that's all I know. Among them, eyes of stars and extinguishment are of no use here. Disarming loop is useful, but it's far from enough to stop the monster. Lucian was still standing there, his eyes staring at the monster. The zombie raised Scar with its two claws and directly tore him in half. Lucian could hear that Scar's heart, liver and guts fell onto the ground with profuse bleeding. Scar's thrilling scream was still echoing in the pipes. Beov, mage hand. Also not powerful enough. Acid splash. Wait. Sulfur is required to cast Acid Splash, which is also a component of gunpowder. And during the casting process the sulfur is lit. Lucian's brain was striving for survival. He would not let his brain become another feast for the monster. The zombie opened Scar's head, in which the white brain tissue was still slightly shaking like a bowl of jelly. Lucian could feel the effects of its dread aura. His heart was racing and he felt breathless. He knew he couldn't lose his mind. Thus, he started analyzing the magic structure of Acid Splash, while his right hand reached into his pocket and grabbed a handful of sulfur. I gotta stop the magic reaction halfway when the sulfur is lit. The notes mentioned that it would backfire. The consequence going from exhausting spiritual power to severe damage in soul, or even worse. Analyzing the structure of the magic, Lucian tried to break it down into several parts to skip the acid dot reaction part during the casting process and only keep the fire from the sulfur. The process of deconstruction and reconstruction needed to be repeated several times. Even if acid splash was only a very simple apprentice dot level spell, it was still very challenging for Lucian. Honestly, he was not sure if he wouldn't kill himself by doing this. But he had no other choice. The zombie devoured the brain and threw Scar's body away. Slowly it turned to Lucian and suddenly started running towards its last target. In Lucian's eyes all of these was like a slow motion, he could smell the stink of death and feel the overwhelming horror. No one could tell Lucian's fear from his face. Lucian didn't move at all. He was just standing there with the sulfur slowly falling through his fingers. The zombie was even faster than Lucian thought. In a second, the horrible creature was only a meter away from him. In the meantime Lucian started casting the spell and then forced himself to stop before it was completely finished. As if he was hammered in the head, 
Dizziness seized him and his nose started to bleed, but instantly a trail of fire showed up in front of Lucian. The claw of the zombie was just a few inches away from Lucian's head. Lucian's power was completely exhausted and he could not sustain the fire and let it grow anymore. In the last moment he released the fire and fell onto the ground. He had tried his best. The zombie's claw got his clothes and left a long tear on them. Suddenly a fire wall exploded between Lucian and the zombie. He raised his injured hands instinctively to protect his head, and then rolled away from the blue fire. The fire wall did not last long. However, after a whoosh the zombie was covered in flames like a human dot-shaped torch. Swinging its claws, the zombie stopped attacking Lucian and started stumbling towards the water, but the monster became much slower now. Of course, Lucian wouldn't let it go back into the river. Grabbing the dagger, he stood up and caught up with the zombie. Lucian fiercely kicked the zombie down and stabbed the dagger into the holes where the two white flames were flickering. Lucian felt the burning pain caused by the heat. Once, twice. Lucian was too afraid to stop himself from stabbing the monster, as if the zombie would seize the chance and tear him in half if he lost the momentum for even a second. Even though, the zombie was still crawling towards the river with flame on its back. But few meters away from the river, the white flames in its eyes were finally extinguished and its bones collapsed. Gasping with great effort, Lucian took out the zombie's brain with his dagger. He still remembered that he needed it. After its brain had been taken away, soon the zombie turned completely into ashes, in which something small was shining there. Chapter 33 The Ring You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Winnie Ethipu, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion grabbing his dagger, Lucian cautiously approached the pile of ash. The shiny item was actually a carved silver ring, inlaid with a small blue gem on top. It belonged to the zombie. Lucian was surprised. He picked the ring up and started scrutinizing it carefully. There was a line of letters on its surface, which was written in the common tongue. Human nature can be colder than snow. The ring was just plain dot looking, but when Lucian rubbed it gently he felt a mysterious and amazing power coming from the gem. After a few minutes, when Lucian's power started slowly recovering from the magic backfire, he carefully examined the ring again using his spiritual power. Lucian's injured soul was slightly shocked as soon as his spirit entered into the ring. He felt inside the gem what seemed to be the power of Blizzard, but its structure was way more complicated than that of the apprentice.level magic. It's a magic ring. Maybe that's why the zombie seemed much stronger than the others. Lucian was excited, it seems that the ring's even superior to Benjamin's truth badge. I wonder which power level the ring belongs to. With his remaining spiritual power, Lucian couldn't even understand the magic structure in the ring, not to mention how to leave his own spiritual imprint on the structure, in order to use the power. A sorcerer with the first circle spell called Identify could directly understand the magic properties of all level 1 magic items, without having to analyze their inner structures. One's ability in using Identify would grow along with their accumulated knowledge, and thus the person could progress and start using the items of higher level. Sometimes there was extra information in some of them, including their makers, for what purposes they were made, and so on. According to the witch's notes, all of the magic items could be divided into different standards. Apprentice level, level 1 to 9, and legend level. The evaluation criteria was based on the power of the magic item. If the power was equal to a first circle magic or to the ability of a level 1 knight, it was, correspondingly, a level 1 magic item. Nevertheless, there were four ranks within each level, low, medium, high and perfect. Taking a ring enchanted with the third circle spell lightning for example, if the ring could be used once a day, it was a low dot rank level 3 magic ring, if it could be used three times a day, it would instead be considered a medium dot rank level 3 1, if the ring had some extra benefits like increasing the magic resistance of the user, it would be a high dot rank level 3 item. If a magic item had some kind of permanent augmentation effect, 
it would be a level higher than the other common ones. For example, Mind Blank was an 8 circle spell, and a magic item with the immunity towards this ring point 8 magic would be recognized as a precious level 9 magic artifact. Furthermore, the grading was also applied to magic weapons and armors. Lucian did not know the ring very well, so he dare not wear it casually in case there was any curse on it. After putting the ring in his pocket he was in a pretty good mood. However, when he noticed all the bodies and blood around him, he knew that he had more work to do. Most importantly, he needed to learn how to preserve the aquatic zombie's brain tissue. Lucian did not know how to use the apprentice spell called organ preservation yet, but the zombie's brain tissue should be able to last from 3 to 5 days, which should be enough time for Lucian to master the spell. According to the notes, organ preservation was a spell that could actually be used for keeping many other things fresh, besides organs. 24 hours duration each time. No magic reagent required. After opening the zombie's skull with the dagger, Lucian saw its black brain, which looked like countless disgusting worms entangling each other. Carefully, Lucian put the brain into a bag together with his ice stones. Knowing lots of money would be needed for learning magic in the future, Lucian plundered all the money from the bodies, including the two hollow dot-headed ones in the river. He got 30.3 nars and 50.2 fells in total. Looking at his bulging money bag, a smile appeared on Lucian's face. However, when Lucian was collecting the money he noticed he couldn't see things clearly and his head was buzzing sometimes. Finally he realized that these were the sequelae from his spirit damage. There was no magic potion mentioned in the notes that could be used for this kind of injury. Therefore, the recovery might take a while. Then, Lucian started doing the labor. Holding his breath, he wrapped up the guts scattered on the ground and threw them away into the river, along with the bodies. Gradually he started getting used to the scene and even took a closer look at Scar's kidney. Lucian believed that soon all of them would become fish food in the Bolem River. After rinsing away the blood on the ground, it was about time he left this place. It seems like the heresy has nothing to do with the aquatic zombie. Lucian thought to himself while he was walking, then what about the red that eyed rats? Lucian decided that tomorrow morning he would go to Lord Venn's manor to find John before going to the Musicians Association. He had to talk to John about the heresy, but, of course, without telling him what actually happened down here. Several pastors in training would come down to the sewers once every three days to clean up the trash in the river using spells. Dot but the person stepping out of a shadow after Lucian left was definitely not a new pastor. The Lord of Argent, the forever lasting silence. The person giggled in a mix of disgust and amusement, continuously talking to himself, a different name, a different identity. Interesting. That person must have been bewitched by him. I can't wait to see his shadow coming upon the land. A battle between him and the Cardinal of Alto will be very interesting. Um. Probably there is some kind of legacy left by the previous ancient magic empire that he could utilize. But the church would interrupt his plan, I bet. The person looked around. A cunning smile appeared upon his face. The pretty smart young guy just created the new apprentice magic, sulfuric fire wall, by himself. Impressive. He can be very useful to me. Then his figure split into countless small shadow pieces and he suddenly disappeared. Only his giggles were left there, echoing in the pipes. Chapter 34 Ice Revenger You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Winnie Ethipu, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion Half an hour later, another figure appeared in the pipes, close to the broken iron net. It was a decently dressed man in his thirties, black shirt, black suit, black shoes, almost everything black. His mustache was carefully trimmed, and his hair was a pompadour style. Graceful as the man might look, he had a dark aura of ferocity and brutality, and he was not a nobleman. He was Rosen Aaron. All his men knew that Rosen Aaron was a knight who had already awakened the blessing in his blood. When he was about to become a grand knight, Unfortunately, 
his power went awry and turned out to be vicious and dark. The power not only destroyed his noble title, but also caused Aaron's endless hiding from the church. Aaron hated the god for treating him so cruelly. Losing all of his possessions, for a long time he lived like a rat, hiding all the time. While he was trying to at least dress like a nobleman, bitter hatred was still burning his guts day and night. The grading of knight and pastor was similar to the different levels of sorcerer. The ability to use the third circle spell fly, the sixth circle spell magic trigger, or many other ninth circle spells symbolized different levels of sorcerer. When a sorcerer or sorceress could start using one of these spells, it meant he or she had made a new breakthrough. Their spiritual power would grow by a large extent, and their souls would transform into a higher dot level form. Even their lives would be extended. In the ancient magic empire, people regarded the first and second circle sorcerers as junior dot rank mages, while third to fifth circle were middle dot rank mages, and sixth to eighth circle, senior dot rank mages. Above them, a ninth circle sorcerer or sorceress would be respected as an archmage. Similarly, the levels 3, 6, and 9 were the key promoting points for a knight. If a person successfully awakened the blessing in their blood, they would first become a level 1 or level 2 knight. From level 3 to 5, they would be regarded as a grand knight, then 6 to 8, a radiant knight, in level 9 the title was gold knight, and after that was the highest level of all, a legendary knight. For pastors, it went from junior dot rank to middle dot rank pastor. Then a middle dot rank pastor could be promoted to bishop. For the senior dot rank pastors, most of them would become cardinals. There was no special title for a level 9 pastor, but if one could successfully join the conclave, he or she would be respected as a grand cardinal. There were more than 400 registered official knights in the Duchy of Orvert. Among them, there were only around 50 grand knights and less than 10 radiant knights. Most of them were members of the Violet Knights, garrisoning different key fortresses. Back then, Aaron, who was a level 2 knight, was very close to becoming a grand knight, and thus ranking among the top 50 knights in the duchy. Now, he has been working for a big man for a long time, doing all the evil and bloody things for him to maintain his fake honor. Jackson and his men did not come back to the hideout in time. Aaron felt something went wrong, so he came down here himself. Sulfur, blood. And something else. Sniffing the air, Aaron's eyebrows frowned together. With the blessing power, Aaron was more sensitive to environment in general than common people. Aaron could tell that someone had cleaned this place up before. But there were still slight traces of blood, brain tissue, acid and sulfur on the ground, showing that a fierce struggle just happened here. Acid. Sulfur. Aaron was thinking out loud, acid splash. It was a typical apprentice spell. An apprentice sorcerer did all this. Aaron could not believe his guess, but the reasoning did make sense. The person who did this had left quite a while before he arrived. It was too late for Aaron to track the responsible. Aaron was also concerned that what they were doing would be reported to the church or nobles. It was still possible to track him if he turned to the priests of Silverhorn for help, but Aaron would not. He knew their magic could not guarantee finding the person, and more importantly, if the person had already reported what they did to the church, what he should do immediately was escape. Then Aaron quickly turned around and disappeared in the darkness. Only his footsteps were still echoing there in the sewers. Lying in the bed, Lucian was too nervous to fall asleep. Any little noise could scare Lucian out of the bed. Since there was no chance for him to have a good rest for now, he decided to take a look at the ring again. Doing research could calm Lucian down, and also if his enemies did find him, the ring might help. Dot inside the ring there was a solid geometric model, of which the structure was not very complicated. With his high school mathematics and physics knowledge, it only took Lucian an hour to finish the analysis. But when Lucian was trying to imprint his spiritual mark on the magic structure, he almost failed during the process. His soul was damaged and Lucian felt his power totally unstable. 
With great effort, the magic structure was finally imprinted with Lucian's mark. The information of the ring came to his mind. The original owner of the ring, Ice Revenger, was a sorcerer apprentice who was betrayed by his best friend. In order to take his revenge, the apprentice turned to a great alchemist for help and spent all his money on that. The ring felt ice dot cold, so he could bear the bitterness of being betrayed in his mind. A second circle spell, Palmyra's Frost Blades, was sealed in the ring. The spell could torture people with bitter cold and pain. The ring could help promoting the spiritual power of its owner to match a level 1 knight strength. Furthermore, its owner could also use Palmyra's Frost Blades once a day. Therefore, it was a middle dot rank level 2 magic item. Lucian was not going to wear the ring for now, since it would definitely draw some attention and bring him unnecessary trouble, but he decided to carry the ring in his pocket, just in case. Lucian woke up early at dawn with a bad headache. He felt dizzy and also had a fever. His physical weakness was caused by his internal injury from the magic backfire. There was no time for breakfast. Lucian wanted to report the heretics to Lord Venn as soon as possible. After changing to new linen clothes, he pushed the door open and headed towards Lord Venn's manor. The cool air outside was refreshing. He took a deep breath and felt his headache lessened. After forty minutes walking, Lucian finally saw the magnificent manor. Lord Venn was a level two knight who used to pledge his allegiance to the Violet Knights. The Grand Duke of Orvert and him became good friends when the Grand Duke was still the Violet Count and the commander of the Violet Knights. When Lord Venn became older, he left the fortress in the Dark Mountain Range and started having a more peaceful lifestyle here. But from time to time, he was summoned to the palace to be the Grand Duke's military consultant. The manor was surrounded by a high wall and several watchtowers, demonstrating the owner's military background. Outside of the manor, a number of farmers had already started working. Two young men in their grey knight squire uniforms were patrolling, followed by some guards. Who are you? What are you doing here? Noticing Lucian was walking towards them, a dark blonde knight asked sternly. Chapter 35 Report you are listening at novel full dot audio. Translator. Winnie Ethipu, Chris underscore Lou Editor. Vermilion facing the night squire, Lucian replied politely. I'm a friend of John's. I'm looking for John to tell him something important, the dark blonde man, Ian, made a snort in contempt. Why should I trust you? Just because you claim to be John's friend. John and other night squires are in training. I can't let you in, unless you have proof of your identity. Quite obviously, Ian did not get along well with John. Lord Venn always had John in high esteem, which made Ian feel more than jealous. In his eyes, John was just a stupid pauper who somehow got a chance to become a knight squire and was always using the knight rules to please Lord Venn, while he was definitely better educated and more talented. Another knight squire, Durego, felt the same way. Thus he just stood there, watching while Ian gave the newcomer a hard time. Ian thought that a poor youngster like the one who was standing in front of him would be frightened by the posture of a knight squire. Were it the case, the youngster might just give up or start begging them on his knees. After going through so many difficulties and challenges, Lucian understood clearly what he was facing. In his eyes, it was ridiculous to see the two squires trying to pick on him, a nobody. Lucian answered seriously, John's friend is in great danger. If John can't make it back in time to avoid it, both of you will be responsible for the consequences. I'm pretty sure that Lord Venn would definitely not be happy with what you guys are doing here. He knew that Lord Venn was a nobleman who strictly stick to night rules all the way in his life. If Lord Venn knew his men violated the rules, he would punish them severely and drive them away from his land with no hesitation. How dare you threaten me, you little bastard. Stepping forward, Ian was so furious that he almost pulled out his knight sword. Lucian could feel the pressure coming from the high-level knight squire. Even the guard standing behind him felt frightened. What was out of their expectation was that Lucian was still the same, calm and serious. 
He asked sternly, are you gonna kill me, an innocent and unarmed boy, right now? It seemed like he was not affected by Ian's posture at all. His willpower was stronger than the threat. Did you hear what I said? Now it was Lucian's turn to take a step forward, do you still want to be a knight? Ian's anger was burning his guts, but he knew if he really killed this bastard, his future title, rank, land and manor would all be gone. He was not stupid. Durego tried to make the situation easier for Ian. After giving Lucian a distasteful glance, Durego hauled Ian back. Don't waste our time on this. Don't let me see you again, said Ian viciously. Then he turned directly toward the manor. Durego's face looked grim. He just stood there, waiting for Ian. It didn't bother Lucian at all. As soon as he realized Ian and Durego were trying to cause him trouble, Lucian reached his hand into the pocket carrying the ring. The power of the ring helped increase his willpower to a higher level that could compete with a level 1 knight. Thus, of course the pressure from Ian, a knight squire, could not affect him. Less than five minutes later, Lucian saw John running out from the gate in a hurry, followed by Ian, who was walking slowly behind him. John was very surprised when he recognized that it was Lucian. You're here, Lucian. I thought you were the one who was in danger, follow me. I'll explain it to you. Lucian stopped when he was sure that Ian and Durego couldn't hear their conversation. Then he turned to John, and started telling his well. Prepared story. I met a weird old beggar a few days ago, Lucian put a worried look on his face, at first, he was just complaining about the nobles and knights, but later, yesterday, when no one was around, he started accusing God. And I realized he was a believer of the devil, who was doing his vicious missionary work in Alto. I was about to report to the church, but I saw he was secretly meeting Jackson. I'm afraid that the gangsters are involved with the heretic, and they may seize the chance and take revenge on us, or what's worse, on your parents. If you can report to Lord Venn directly about what's going on here, I believe the nobles and the church would pay more attention to it. Lucian looked into John's eyes. These damned scum. Now they're involved with the devil. Yes, you're right. I should report it to Lord Venn immediately. John took Lucian's words directly without any doubt. And John, I'm afraid the situation is even more severe than you thought. I counted. There are just about ten beggars now in Alto. Many of them. Disappeared. Lucian continued warning him. But he could not tell John what happened in the sewers. Frowning his eyebrows, John could guess what happened to these poor homeless guys, blood sacrifice, he murmured. Lucian nodded seriously. Yes, that's what I'm guessing. But John, remember, don't tell Lord Venn that I was the one who found this out. I'm afraid some heretics would seek revenge on me. I have no power to protect myself. But you'll be awarded for reporting this, said John. Clapping on John's shoulder, Lucian's face softened a bit. I'm more concerned with my life, John. Remember to ask Lord Venn not to divulge your information as well. You have a family to take care. They don't know how to fight as well. I will. You're always this careful, Lucian. John nodded. There was nothing more important than his family. But if there's any award, part of it is still yours. John promised. Lucian smiled, thanks John. John stayed a bit longer with Lucian. Since Lucian told Ian and Durego that John's friend was in danger, it would be quite suspicious if John went back to the manor straight away. After John left, Lucian decided to wait for a few more minutes to make sure that everything was going as expected. A while later, Lucian was relieved when he saw a line of knights galloping across the field. Besides John, there were six squires and a young pastor led by a serious dot looking elder knight. When Lucian went back to Alto, he felt some vibration under the ground from the sewers. Lord Venn's men were there already. To be prudent, Lucian decided he would not go back into the sewers for a while. Recently he was focusing on analyzing magic. 
Some time before the clock showed 8.30, Lucian finally arrived at his workplace, the Musicians' Association, in time for his shift. Chapter 36 Pierre you are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Winnie Ethipul, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion Elena was anxiously waiting for Lucian in the hall. Being late on the first day of work would definitely not make a good first impression on the director, Mr. Hank. Another receptionist, Kathy, smiled to her colleague and joked, Elena, who are you waiting for? Your sweetheart. Come on, Kathy. I'm waiting for a friend of mine. Today's his first day working for the association. When Elena was talking, Lucian came into the hall. Thanks God, you are here, Lucian. Elena walked out of the counter and toward Lucian, why do you look so tired? Are you sick? Lucian knew he must look terrible. The headache caused by his soul injury was torturing him all the way. After rushing here, he felt quite dizzy. Well. I think so. But I'm okay. Thank you for asking, Elena. Lucian smiled to Elena, who was wearing a long white dress today. I think we're gonna meet Mr. Hank now, aren't we? asked Lucian. Yes, we are. Elena started walking upstairs, and was followed by Lucian, no worries. Sunday's never a busy day, or say, the work is not busy in general. Mr. Hank was a middle-aged serious man, who was always wearing a decent suit. After asking some basic questions, Mr. Hank just nodded and asked Elena to lead Lucian directly to the library. The library was on the second floor. While they were heading toward it, Elena was trying to describe the other librarian to Lucian, his name is Pierre Sandor. Both of you work the morning shift in the library. He's an okay guy. I don't think he'll give you a hard time, so no worries. But he's a bit. Um. Elena paused for a few seconds, weird. The guy called Pierre should also have some connections in the association, or he would have no chance working as a librarian here if he was just a nobody. Lucien just wanted to do his own work and avoid trouble as much as possible. The music library was huge and quiet, and thousands of precious music books, journals, and newspaper were collected here. There was only a black dot haired young guy sitting behind the wood counter, reading the tablature carefully. In Lucien's eyes, the guy looked like a big fan of music. Pierre, Pierre. Elena tried to draw his attention, this is the new librarian, Lucien. Finally, Pierre raised his head from the book. His brown eyes looked a bit confused. Morning, Elena. What day is it today? Sunday. Nice to meet you, Pierre. I'm Lucien Evans, the new librarian. Lucien introduced himself with a warm smile. Just realizing his new colleague was standing in front of him, Pierre walked out of the counter and greeted Lucien, Nice to meet you, Lucien. I'm Pierre Sandor. When they were shaking hands, Pierre put on a sly smile, Lucien, you'd better. Refrain yourself a bit. What are you talking about, Pierre? Elena was confused. ENV, just guy's conversation, answered Pierre casually. Shrugging her shoulders, Elena whispered to Lucien, you see. I told you. And I gotta go now, Lucien. Make good use of the books here, and work hard. After Elena left, Pierre started showing Lucien around. While he was walking, he talked to Lucien casually, um. I sometimes talk in a weird way. If you don't understand, don't let my words disturb you. So you asking me to refrain myself was also a casual talk, asked Lucien. Nope, that was serious. Guys in our age can easily drain ourselves from too much. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Lucien didn't know what to say. Now in Lucien's eyes, Pierre looked like a big fan of music, and kind of nasty. After introducing the basic stuff that Lucien had to do as a librarian here, Pierre stretched himself a bit and said, only the members of the association can have access to this library, so it's never busy here. Just remember to be polite to the musicians. 
you can spend more time here, and I'm gonna go back and enjoy the well-tempered clavier now. His eyes were glowing when he mentioned music. Sure. Lucian was more than willing to be left alone. With his spirit library, Lucian was always trying to store more books in it, like a squirrel collecting its favorite cones. Lucian quickly leafed through a book, and a copy of the book instantly appeared in his spirit library. Then Lucian directly turned to another one. Hey, what are you doing there? Pierre asked in a confused way. He hadn't gone far yet. I'm doing a random check here to see if there are any damaged ones. Then I can take note of them and report to the association. Lucian immediately made up an excuse. You're as careful as a woman, Lucian. Pierre commented. In the following four hours, only two musicians visited the library. Lucian thus managed to collect more than a hundred of the books there. His arms felt pretty sore from leafing through them. The books covered many aspects of the world, not just music. Lucian wanted to have a better understanding of the world as soon as possible. Lucian finished his work at about half past midday. When he was leaving the library, Pierre was still immersed in music, with a bread in his hand. Later, Lucian went to Mr. Victor's place and continued his study. Life was pretty peaceful in the following couple of days. One evening, John came back. When no one was around, he started telling Lucian what happened on that day. Chapter 37 Choosing a Musical Instrument You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Winnie Ethipu, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion Joel was still not at home when John and Lucian were talking, and Auntie Elisa was busy preparing dinner. Their youngest son, Ivan, was still playing on the streets with his friends. You can never imagine what we found down there, John said seriously, there was a demon hall. What? Lucian was more than surprised, they built a hall down the sewers. Has Lord Venn questioned the heretics yet? Shaking his head, John sighed with disappointment, no, Lucian. We didn't find anyone there. All of them were already gone by the time we arrived. Dot it's impossible, John. I didn't tell anyone else about this except you. Lucian started feeling worried. What if the demon followers somehow found out it was him who exposed and denounced them? Lord Venn told me that information about our actions might have been leaked by a knight. We don't know who did this yet, but if it's true, the knight should be of a relatively high level. Lucian thought about the possibility that the heretic power had infiltrated into the upper class. However, it was astonishing to imagine that the evil power had corroded some of the noble knights. What about Aaron's gang? Lucian asked. The leaders escaped, including Rose and Aaron. The rest of the gangsters know nothing about the heresy. They can't lie in front of the divine power of the Inquisition. John's eyebrows frowned, even though they know nothing, all of them will be sentenced to death by the judges. Facing heresy, the church never showed mercy. And Lucian believed that the way the church treated sorcerers would not be any better than that. One of the books from the library that Lucian read recently was called Hunting Sorcerer, which was written in the year 392 of the Saint Calendar, or say, 423 years ago. It was an instruction for sorcerer hunters and night watchers telling them how to identify the sorcerers, how to track them and even how to torture them. Lucian remembered some of the paragraphs, which sounded ridiculous and cruel to him. If a suspect lives in an unsociable or eccentric way, the chance of him or her being a sorcerer or a sorceress is high. However, even if a suspect is always sociable and passionate, the possibility still could not be ruled out, because he or she might just be pretending. If the person you suspect panics when he or she knows who you are, the person is a sorcerer. But if the person does not, don't lower our guard, because all the sorcerers are experienced liars. If your divine spells cannot help you make sure the identity of the suspect, inflicting sacred punishment on the suspect can be useful. If the person rolls eyes when facing the punishment, that means he or she is trying to communicate with demons to seek for power, 
if the person's eyes glaze fearlessly, that means he or she has got the protection from devil power and thus you must torture the person in a more severe way, if the person dies, it is because the demons took his or her life in order to keep their secrets safe. If you have tried them all but still cannot be sure, leave the suspect to our Almighty God. Burn the suspect. A sorcerer would burn down to ashes, while God would protect the person safe and sound in the fire if he or she is innocent. Lucian was grateful for still being alive. If Lucian had lived 400 years ago when the book was written, he would have been burned to death thousands of times. The church had been dominating the whole continent for so many years, thus they were now paying more attention to the heresy in the north, instead of going all out hunting scattered sorcerers and sorceresses. Then did you find anything in the demon hall? Lucian asked with curiosity. Bad memories made John's eyebrows frown even tighter, we night squires didn't go in there. Knights and pastors led by Lord Venn, Lord Verdi and the Cardinal of Salvatore searched the hall. Lord Venn never told me what he saw there, but I saw his face when he walked out. He looked very serious. I was guarding outside of the gate. John's eyes looked down at the ground and Lucian could tell the bad memory still disturbed him, when they opened the gate, I saw the ground was covered with blood. And I saw hearts. Living throbbing hearts on the ground. They said that those were hearts extracted from people's chests when they were alive. Lucian, I've heard many stories, poems and rumors saying how horrible and vicious the heresy is, but today I finally realized how hateful and inhuman it can be. John raised his head and looked at Lucian, speaking with great determination, I hate them, the heretics. I can never forget what I saw there. I want to grow stronger and eliminate the demons completely. Looking at his serious face, Lucian smiled, this is the justice you're looking for, isn't it, John? John nodded, but then shook his head, I still don't clearly know what kind of justice I'm looking for, Lucian. All I know is that I not only want to protect my families and friends, but I also want to protect more people and fight against the dark powers. I know there's a class among the knights called, Demon Hunter. They walk in the darkness and are willing to die fighting against the devil power. Is that your dream now? asked Lucian. I don't know, Lucian. I still can't awaken my blessing power. Not everyone can become a real knight, not to mention becoming a demon hunter. John replied, a bit depressed. Come on. Of course you can. Lucian gave John a friendly nudge, look who am I talking to. The most promising knight squire appreciated by Lord Venn. Feeling the encouragement from his best friend, John grinned at Lucian. Talking about Lord Venn. Lucian asked, did he mention anything about your reward? Yes, sure. John's face was lightened by this topic, Lord Venn promised to give me a good knight's sword made of fine steel. Compared with what I'm using now, this one would be much sharper and even have some magic effects on it. Talking about the new sword, John even giggled a bit with sweet expectation. Lucian and John stopped their conversation when Joel came back. In the end, John reminded Lucian, Lord Venn told me that security will be tightened and there will be much more undercover investigations in Alto recently. You were questioned before because of the witch, so be careful recently. You're Mr. Victor's student now, and you never know if there's anyone who'd frame you for this out of jealousy. Thank you, John. I'll be careful, said Lucian gratefully. He knew that, as a knight squire, John was not allowed to leak this kind of information to someone else. Lucian knew he had to be really careful recently and stop practicing most of the spells that could cause a mess. However, Lucian also believed that after this massive search, when the knights and the nobles started letting down their vigilance, it would be even safer than before. Another Sunday morning, and Lucian was trying to organize everything on his day off. Although he was not practicing much casting during the past couple of days, his analysis work of the other several magic spells went on pretty well. His spiritual power was completely recovered and grew even stronger than ever with his meditation. For now, Lucian could cast up to six spells of the element school successively. In his spare time, Lucian also worked hard on his music studies. 
He spent lots of time with reading different books in his spirit library, but not only music books. From a variety of books, Lucian started to learn more about the continent. Those countries believing in the God of Truth in the South, and heretic countries in the North, as well as the evil creatures living in the, the Dark Mountain Range. BDNV The brain tissue of the mutant aquatic zombie could be preserved up to three years by exerting the magic once a day, which enabled Lucian to have enough time to collect the rest of the magic matters. Your progress impressed me again, Lucian. After testing Lucian's basic music knowledge learned within the several classes, Mr. Victor commended, then we can move forward to actual practice and to learn how to integrate what you've learned from the books into it. When Lucian first helped with improving the harpsichord, Victor thought that Lucian might just happen to have an inspiration there. But now Victor felt that Lucian at least had some talent in music. Lucian, what musical instrument do you want to learn? asked Victor gently, I'm relatively good at violin, harpsichord, pipe organ and flute. But if you want to learn something else, I should also be able to help. Lucian never really put much thought into it. He was a bit hesitant. Lucian was a fan of piano back in the days, but he never had a chance to learn how to play it. But on second thought, one day Lucian would set out to find the headquarter of the Continental Congress of Magic and, of course, he could not carry a piano with him all the way. Probably he should choose something relatively portable, like a violin. Lot, Felicia and Herodotus were curious to see which one Lucian would choose, but Lucian was still hesitating. It's okay, Lucian. Victor smiled, if you have any concern, just tell me. Maybe I can help you. So Lucian asked cordially, Mr. Victor, can I choose both the improved harpsichord and violin? The rest of the three students were a bit pissed off. They felt Lucian was being really greedy because he could learn for free. No problem, answered Victor, but you gotta focus on one thing at a time. What about we start from learning harpsichord? And I can probably get some new ideas while I'm teaching. Sure, thank you, Mr. Victor. Lucian was grateful. Chapter 38 Modern Piano Fingering You are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Winnie Ethipu, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion standing up from the couch, Victor clapped his hands delightfully, all right. Mr. Ryan and Mr. Chevelle have finished the improvement of the harpsichord a couple of days ago. Let's try the new harpsichord today. All of you can come. I even feel that I shouldn't call it a harpsichord anymore, since its tone, its range, and its volume are completely different now. For me, it's a revolution in string instruments. Seeing the joy on his face, Lucian could tell that Mr. Victor was very satisfied with the improvement. Mr. Victor, as the initiator of the harpsichord improvement, you may like to give the new invention an official name. When they were walking upstairs, Lot talked to his teacher in a flattering way. Yes, Ryan, Chevelle and I actually talked about the name before. However, none of U.S. could find a proper name for it. Victor looked at Lucian with a mild smile on his face, Lucian, what's your idea? My idea. Lucian was a bit surprised. Of course, you made no small contribution to this. We'd like to hear your suggestion, said Victor, well. Ryan appreciated its mechanical sophistication, so he wanted to name it Mechanical Harpsichord. I mean Demar. Ryan is a talent in music, but definitely not good at naming a new musical instrument. Mechanical Harpsichord doesn't sound right to me at all. What's your idea then, sir? Lucian asked. Um. I prefer to have a new name. This new musical instrument combines both the features of harpsichord and clavichord, and it has a much wider range of tones compared with its predecessors. So I would suggest the name to be. Superchord. Dot. Including Lucian, none of the students present knew what to say toward this name. Well, what about the name, Pianofort, dot? Lucian said with uncertainty. Pianofort. It's a pretty new name, but it sounds a bit weird. Victor rubbed his chin with his hand in thoughts. 
the sounds produced by the new instrument were an extension of what the harpsichord could do. Lucian was trying to make the weird name make sense. Lucian knew, in his world, the first piano made by the Italian harpsichord maker Cristofori was first called pianoforte. In Italian, pianoforte meant soft loud. Lucian wanted to keep the name, because it would be sweet if he could play an instrument in this world which was almost the same as a piano on earth. Pianoforte. Pianoforte. Victor found the name was pretty interesting, what about just piano dot? Lucian was very surprised that Victor would appreciate the name. I like the name, piano dot. Felicia agreed, which was even more beyond Lucian's expectation. It was the first time Felicia showed her commendation for any of Lucian's ideas. A faint blush appeared on her beautiful face, I don't know why. I just somehow feel like it's the proper name. Mr. Victor nodded with a bit of confusion, yes. I feel the same way, Felicia. Piano. It feels like it should be called piano. Weird. Yeah that that's how I feel as well. Lucian was a bit nervous. He did not understand why both Mr. Victor and Felicia had a special feeling toward the name. Hurriedly, he changed the topic, I can hear someone playing music in the practice room upstairs. Yes, Mr. Ryan is here today. Didn't I mention it? Victor answered with joy. Felicia's face was now as red as a ripe tomato. Ryan was sitting in front of the piano, his hair silver and his gesture charming. Without moving his shoulders and arms, his fingers were dancing on the piano keyboards, and a beautiful piece of music was flowing out of the musical instrument. They indulged themselves in the joys of the song. No one made a sound until Ryan finished playing. All the students and Mr. Victor started applauding for the amazing performance. Mr. Ryan. As an excellent violinist, it's amazing that your skill in playing clavichord is also great. Felicia's eyes were glowing, your performance was as good as Ms. Sylvia's. Standing from the bench, Ryan bowed to them elegantly with his right hand on his chest. He was trying to play the same song on both the clavichord and the piano to see the difference. He turned to Felicia and smiled, I'm flattered, Felicia. But I can never compete with Ms. Sylvia. It was she who wrote this song after all. Ms. Sylvia was the best clavichord player in alto. Since clavichord was ideal for playing in a relatively small space, like in a living room or even bedroom, Mr. Sylvia was often invited by the noble ladies to play in their places. It was said that Ms. Sylvia was a close friend of Princess Natasha, and thus she enjoyed a high reputation in the association. That when Ryan was playing, Lucian paid more attention on the movement of his fingers. At the same time, he searched in his spirit library and found some useful books to refer to. According to these books, the modification of a musical instrument was the main cause of the changes in fingerings, as well as the holistic style. The piano standing beside them had 80.8 .8 keys and different pedals, which was already very close to a modern piano on earth. Thus Lucian believed the modern piano fingering should be the best way of playing it. On earth, people used to play clavichord with three fingers of each hand. Then the famous pianist, Bach, started using his thumbs and little fingers. When piano gained its popularity, Chopin made a second revolution in fingerings by also playing the black keys with his thumb and little finger. When Lucian was reviewing the basic modern fingering books in his mind, Victor told Ryan about the new name of the instrument. It turned out that Ryan loved the name as well. Come here, Lucian. Sit in front of the piano. I'm gonna show you the basic fingerings. Victor said to him. Lucian trotted toward Mr. Victor with a bit excitement. However, as soon as he sat on the bench, Lucian felt something was not right. It was a bit too short for the piano. Mr. Victor, can I have a taller bench? asked Lucian. Why? You're not much shorter than Mr. Ryan. The height should be fine. Victor was a bit surprised. Extending his arms, Lucian tried to show it to Mr. Victor, but if I sit on a bench of this height, I could only use my fingers and wrists. 
If I want to use my lower and upper arm, as well as my shoulder, I need a taller bench, otherwise it would be too awkward. That's because you're not supposed to use your arms and shoulders. That's too rude. Victor was pretty serious, forget about what you've seen in the pubs. You saw how Mr. Ryan played, didn't you? Did he ever use his arms and shoulders? Victor's reaction was within Lucian's expectation. Modern piano fingering was quite hard to be accepted by many famous pianists back in the days. In their eyes, pianists using modern fingering like Franz Liszt were rude. The way of swinging arms and shoulders in their mind looked very barbaric and it was like smashing the piano. Yes, Lucian. Those players in the pubs are not well educated. I know. Um. You probably grew up in that environment, but now you're here. It's time for you to see what is noble music now. Seizing the chance, Herodotus scoffed at Lucian's words. Mr. Victor, the piano is a new musical instrument. Lucian explained calmly, I feel that how a musician plays the instrument should depend on the features of it. As an extension of harpsichord, piano is superior in both volume and range. With the strength of arm and shoulder, I feel its features could be presented in a better way. Rhine took a step forward and smiled at Victor, I agree with Lucian. Remember the discussion about fingering several years ago. Probably we can make a real difference again with it. Victor thought for a while and finally said, all right, maybe we can give it a shot. But Lucian, if it later is considered wrong, it would take you a long time to forget the wrong movements and start over again. Are you sure you want to do this? Lucian nodded at Mr. Victor with a determined look. In the other student's eyes, Lucian was no more than an arrogant boy trying to impress Mr. Victor and Mr. Ryan in this stupid way. Chapter 39 The Tawny Owl You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Winnie Ethipu, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion Mr. Victor passed a piece of notation to Lucian, which was written by himself for harpsichord beginners. The song did not require any expert skills, and thus, when it was played on a harpsichord, it was quite plain. However, after the improvement, the tone of the piano would definitely add some splendor to it. With his diligent practice of meditation, Lucian had an even better memory now. It only took him a while to roughly go through the music several times. Before him, Mr. Victor only saw noble students, like Lot and Felicia, being able to do this, because they grew up under the nurture of music since they were born. All right, Lucian. I know you still feel you're not prepared, but it's time for you to start playing. Don't be nervous and just pay attention to the keys you should press down. Take it easy. Mr. Victor was quite looking forward to Lucian's first play. Putting his hands on the keyboard in a defined arch, Lucian pressed down the first key. It was not difficult for him to remember the song, but, as expected, playing it was a completely different story. Lucian felt his fingers were too clumsy to reach the right keys in time. Slow as he was, Lucian tried his best to focus on the keys to make sure they were the correct ones. Instead of a song, his first dot time playing sounded more like a bunch of separated notes climbing out of the piano slowly one by one, or like a dying man exhaling with great effort. However, no one there ever laughed at him, including the three noble students. Watching Lucian play reminded them of their own past struggle, which was even more terrible. It was a short piece of melody, that should last around a minute, but it took Lucian more than three minutes to finish playing it. After he pressed down the last key, his forehead was oozing sweat. Lucian felt that even fighting with an aquatic zombie in the pipes could not be more exhausting. Mr. Victor was the first person who started applauding Lucian, followed by Ryan and the other students. You did a good job, Lucian. Victor comforted him, smiling, I know how clumsy a person would feel when he or she first started playing. But you are the only student I've seen that managed to press every key correctly. It's impressive. Ryan nodded, yes, you are very smart, Lucian. I'm sure you will improve quickly with more practice. 
but the coordination of your hands was for sure not your strong point, and later you will also need to use your feet for the pedals. It'll be pretty challenging for you. I agree, said Mr. Victor, but being more coordinate is just a matter of time. If you're willing to work hard, you'll be a qualified musician within ten years. Ten years. It seemed that even with the direction of a master musician, it still would take a long time for a person to make achieve something in music. However, Lucian was still expecting that, by becoming a qualified musician as soon as possible, his living expenses as well as the cost for his magic experiments could be fully covered. Is there any way to become a qualified musician faster? Lucian asked. Yes, sure, if you're a genius. Felicia interjected, but you are not, Lucian. Working hard is the only way to become a qualified musician, and of course it takes time. Don't let Mr. Victor lose his face for having a student who couldn't even play the piano decently. In Felicia's eyes, Lucian A. question fully showed his shallowness. Ryan responded in a more mild way, I understand young people's eagerness, but like Felicia said, my current small achievement in playing violin took me a long time, and it's the same with other instruments. Then he paused a bit, well, actually hard practice is not the only way to become a qualified musician. If you could awaken the blessing in your blood, your ability of controlling your body would be increased by a large extent. With your smart little brain, you could probably become a piano musician within a few weeks. But how long it would take you to awaken the blessing? Ryan shrugged his shoulders, maybe ten years, maybe twenty years, or forever. What do you think? Becoming a genius sounds more practical, Lucian. Lot laughed. Victor turned to Lucian, if you just want to master a relatively hard piece of melody, an intensive practice within a short period of time may be helpful, but this can never help you become a really good musician. Do not rush, but always work hard, Lucian. Victor tapped Lucian on his shoulders to encourage him. Lucian looked at Mr. Victor and nodded. After the class, Lucian started working on his monthly budget. He needed to give Auntie Elisa three nars every month for the meals because he was now eating with their family more often. Also, more money would be spent on building a secret magic lab in the future, when Alto calmed down and became safer. Besides money, Lucian still had lots of concerns. Buying too many glasswares for magic experiments could be very suspicious to the church, and Lucian currently had no idea what to do with them. He also needed some black robes, so he could sew some rows of small pockets inside for carrying more different magic reagents in the future. Burying his head in his arms, Lucian thought to himself, maybe I'll become a tailor sewing clothes for people rather than a sorcerer. The idea amused him a bit. Several days later, at night, Lucian was reviewing the last magic he analyzed, Holman's Oscillation, even though it was too risky for him to practice the spell at this moment. Besides, by changing the vibration frequency of his spiritual power, now Lucian could leave an imperceptible magic mark on a target, which made him very happy. As for music, like Ryan commented, after a certain stage, his good memory could not help much anymore. His poor coordination became his biggest problem, so Lucian was still practicing the same etude. All of a sudden, Lucian heard someone or something was swiftly approaching his shack. Lucian hid all his stuff under the bed in a hurry and stood there in a defensive posture. Knock, knock, knock. The window opened by itself. Lucian felt a familiar wave of magic power coming inside. He was very nervous, but also kind of excited. Was it another sorcerer apprentice, or even a real sorcerer? A tawny owl flew in through the window and landed on the table. Somehow Lucian felt it had an arrogant dot looking face. And the owl started speaking in a harsh voice. Noel.n, you should open the window for me, you little boy. Lucian was not really scared. In the notes, the witch mentioned some animals that could talk. Some of them were sorcerers or sorceresses transformed into different kind of animals, while some of them were summoned pets. However, Lucian was not sure which one the owl was, yet. Strolling on the table, the arrogant owl looked at Lucian from top to bottom. Then it started talking again. 
Don't be afraid, boy. As long as you answer my questions honestly, Lord Doro won't hurt you. Lucian nodded his head, feeling a bit confused, who was Lord Doro? The owl took a step forward and looked at Lucian's eyes, listen to my question. After the apprentice died, did any sorcerer or sorceress come here and ask you about her? Chapter 40 Tracking you are listening at novelfull.audio Translator Winnie Ethipu, Chris underscore Lou Editor Vermilion as long as all the required reagents were ready, an apprentice could start summoning his or her own pet. With different reagents, there were also different summoned animals. Some could be common animals like owls, cats or ravens, while some could be very powerful magic creatures like a fairy dragon. Once they were summoned, mysterious connections would be built between the owners and them. Thus, an owner could gain some special abilities based on the features of his or her summoned pet, and vice versa. As long as the pet was strong enough to handle magic, it could also use some of its owner's basic spells. For example, if one could summon a cat as his or her companion, the summoner usually would then have good night vision, and there would be also a significant improvement in the person's agility. Meanwhile, the cat could help its owner to cast some of the apprentice spells like darkness and organ preservation, even some basic necromantic spells. However, as to how many spells a companion pet could master, and how many times it could cast the spells depended on its owner's level. That was to say, the power consumed by a spell would not come from the pet, but still from its owner. If the owner's remaining spiritual power was not enough, the pet would not be able to use magic. A summoned companion pet could also grow stronger to higher levels, but the special abilities its owner gained would not be further improved along the process. If the pet died, or somehow the connection was broken, the owner would lose the special abilities deriving from the pet and even be injured. Lucian had never paid much attention to summoning spells before, because having a magic pet in the city under the nose of the church could easily bring him big trouble. A few seconds later, Lucian slowly answered the owl's question, no. I didn't see any other sorcerer or sorceress. The owl flapped its wings in satisfaction, very well. You are indeed not lying. Lord Doro has been watching you for some time, and no one came or asked about her. Sneaky little bird. Lucian almost rolled his eyes. Then, the second question. What happened in the witch's secret chamber and what did you find there? The owl's big round eyes blinked. Well. I went down there with a few guards. Lucian told the owl exactly what had happened in the chamber, except, of course, the part about the magic books being copied to his spirit library. No one would believe that there was a whole library in his soul anyway. What a tragedy for the guard. He lost his arm. The owl sighed, good boy, Lord Doro's job is done now. Good night, little boy. Then it flew directly toward the open window and gradually disappeared in the darkness. Then Lucian finally realized that Doro was the owl's name. Without doubt, the owl had a master, and Lucian wanted to figure out who the person was. So when Lucian was talking, he left an almost undetectable mark on Doro, the owl, with his spiritual power. When he was sure that the owl had flown some distance away from his place, Lucian quickly put on his black robe and ran out of the door. It was very dark outside at midnight and the streets were quiet. Lucian spread his power out and soon detected the owl. The owl did not fly very fast. Lucian was a bit hesitant whether he should follow the bird or not. Doro didn't look like a very strong summon pet, so Lucian was guessing that its owner probably was also an apprentice. But what if there were other sorcerers at the place? A few seconds later, Lucian decided to take the risk. After all, sooner or later, he needed to find other apprentices or sorcerers and join them. Such a good opportunity like the one sitting in front of him was definitely worth the risk. Furthermore, if Lucian found himself in a dangerous situation, he still had a level. Two magic ring to help him, the Ice Revenger. Lucian followed the target and ran on the streets. At the same time, he kept some distance between him and Doro to make sure he wouldn't be noticed. 
About ten minutes later, Lucian saw the owl flying into a window on the second floor of a building covered by darkness. Carefully, he approached it, and was a bit surprised when he found out it was actually the copper coronet. Lucian put his ice revenger on the finger, and then carefully walked toward the back door of the pub. With some easy apprentice spells, he sneaked into the tavern and went upstairs. Luckily, no one was on the corridor at this time. Listening carefully with the help of his spiritual power, Lucian could hear a man talking in a low voice inside one of the rooms. Listening to his owl's report, Smile was sitting in a rocking chair with a glass of wine in his hand. Then he closed his eyes and lay back on the chair, well. It seems that the guy doesn't know the witch as well. Oh no. I have no clue now, not at all. How can I find the man from the Continental Congress? Smile, as long as we keep collecting information. Doro was trying to comfort him. While he was feeling depressed, there was a knock on the front door. Doro jumped to the bed at once and buried himself under the blanket, while Smile bounced out of the rocking chair and asked nervously, Who is it? I'm looking for Doro, the owl, and you, Mr. Smile, a man answered in a calm way. His voice sounded harsh and cold. What? Doro screamed and its big round eyes opened even wider. Dot Smile's spell was ready, but he dare not launch the attack rashly on a stranger who he knew nothing about. I asked, Who are you? Smile repeated. I'm a sorcerer, and I know the witch. Like you, I'm also looking for the man from the Congress. The harsh voice paused a bit and continued, Earlier I heard your owl asking a young boy about the witch, so I followed your pet and came here. What? It was Lord Doro's mistake. What a tragedy, yelled the owl. Smile relaxed a bit. At least he knew it was not the church, or they would have broken the door at once, without any explanation. If you're a sorcerer, you don't need me to open the door for you. Smile did not lower his guard though. If the man opened the door by himself, he could have a few more seconds to better cast defensive measures. Besides, he could tell from the spell if the guy was really a sorcerer, or a pastor in disguise. The two powers were different. Then, the door opened. A freezing cold and threatening power came into the place before the sorcerer entered. Smile took a step back. He knew he was definitely overpowered. None of his apprentice spells would be helpful when facing the other sorcerer's power. Then he saw a mysterious man wearing a black robe, whose face was hidden in the shadow of a hood. Lucian, on the other hand, saw the apprentice's face well enough, and realized that he actually met Smile before. When Lucian first visited Copper Coronet, Smile was the hooked-dot-nosed man sitting beside the pub counter. 